Hello, everyone. Welcome to the finals of Hack 3D, a hackathon competition about security and additive manufacturing organized by New York University, Tandon School of Engineering, and the Center for Cybersecurity. I would like to give special thanks to NSF, National Science Foundation, for the support on the Hack 3D events. I'd also like to acknowledge the following organizers for making Hack 3D possible. Professor Nikhil Gupta from the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering as the Hack 3D faculty lead. Professor Ramesh Kerry from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering as a Hack 3D faculty lead. Dr. Hamid Pierce, a postdoc lead from the Center for Cybersecurity here at NYU Tandon. And myself, Gary Mack, a PhD researcher in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering as the competition coordinator. Next, let's recognize the six student finalist teams which had the best uh, performance in the preliminary round of our Hack 3D challenge. And they consist of students from various universities from New York, Abu Dhabi, and India. And they're all pursuing different degrees in engineering and computer science. They'll be presenting shortly on their solution to the following challenge. In the Hack 3D final challenge, students are given a digital model of a numerical keypad. And as seen from the image on the keypad, there will be a total of seven fingerprints uh, indicating the input by the user. And one of the known tasks is students will have to determine what is the five digit pin passcode that has been entered on the keypad, as well as develop an explanation uh, to explain in which order the seven keys were entered, as well as uh, the third objective within the uh, keypad of the uh, challenge, Students will have to extract and reconstruct a broken QR code to be able to determine the link address that is associated and embedded in the code. So in today's student presentation, we have also invited a panel of three judges to score each student team presentation. And now I would like to invite each judge to give a brief introduction about themselves, starting with Stacey Delvecchia, President of Stacy D Consulting. Thank you, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever all of our uh, teams would be. I'm Stacy Delvecchio, President of Stacy D Consulting, which is focused on uh, the strategy of 3D printing for early adopters. And I come to that uh, role after spending 30 years as Caterpillar, uh, primarily in um, product development. But the last five years of that, I led their additive manufacturing efforts and you know, kind of from startup, figuring up the strategy and then getting it going, getting parts in production, that sort of thing. So a uh, great role, wanted to stay engaged in the community when I left Caterpillar after all that time and went on this, um, the road for Stacey B Consulting and doing the strategy piece on that. I'm also past president of the Society of Women Engineers and I'm looking forward to um, hearing what all of you have done. Thank you, Stacy. Next, we have John Holt, Lead Cybersecurity Engineer from MITRE Corporation. John? Thanks, Gary. Um, so as you said, my name is John Hoyt. So I've been doing uh, industrial automation for about 20 years. Uh, I spent about 10 years automating everything from automobile factories to toilet paper plants uh, and everything in between. So I was really hands-on in the manufacturing sector and producing things at large scale. Um, I've been at the MITRE Corporation for the last four years now, uh, looking at the intersection of uh, manufacturing and cybersecurity, trying to understand what the best practices are, uh, making recommendations, um, doing all kinds of things from doing cyber tabletop exercises to try and determine the worst case scenario for uh, cyber attacks, um, and then also trying to determine realistic solutions to these problems. Uh, as additive manufacturing uh, increases in, in, in wide use in the industry, um, the cybersecurity issues are going to be large in that industry. And so we are working in that area as well to understand what the impacts of, uh, potential impacts of cyber incidents, and then also how to protect these, uh, these valuable machines. Back to you, Gary. 
Thank you, John. And for our third judge, we have Chris Atkins, Chief Scientist from Identify 3D. Over to you, Chris. Morning. <clears throat> Thanks, Gary. So I'm Chris Atkins. Uh, as Gary said, I'm Chief Scientist for Identify 3D. So we, our goal is to protect the digital manufacturing industry, including ad manufacturing um, from uh, security attacks. So um, as you can imagine, with uh, digital manufacturing or added manufacturing, with all the intellectual property being contained in digital files, it's very ripe for cybersecurity attacks. Um, if you can gain that digital information um, in a file or a few files, then you have all the information you need to replicate a part or an assembly. So that can be very powerful um, if your goal is to counterfeit parts. Um, so there's a uh, you know, growing attacks. Um, it's industry that is uh, has substantial growth, um, but without security around the ecosystem, um, there's going to be limitations on, on how um, how large and how successful the industry will be. So um, it's a very interesting growing area to look at. Um, previously, I was at Lexmark for 20 years, looking at working on anti-counterfeit technology. That is uh, very similar actually to kind of the problems you're solving in this uh, Hack 3D uh, program where um, you have a very low cost item that you try to hide some identifying information in that's very hard to copy, but very easy to scan and analyze. So that's an industry that really doesn't have um, a solution like cryptography. So um, again, if you like doing this, maybe something to look into in the future. Thanks. Thank you so much for your introduction, judges. And uh, Hack3D as a competition, a competition we started in uh, 2018 as a small university competition. And over the years, it has uh, grown to um, a, a bigger, much grander competition where we have invited students from uh, internationally to participate as well. And in our competition, we focused on cybersecurity aspects of additive manufacturing process. And to be able to make that possible, uh, we have to invite student teams from different discipline, disciplines to work together and form teams uh, to uh, try to uh, complete the objectives of each of our uh, challenges. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, move on to the student team presentation. And the first team I'd like to introduce is family.py. Uh, so. The first team can uh, go ahead and share your screen and you may begin. Thank you. Um, this is like anywhere sharing our screen. Okay, um, thank you all so much um, and welcome to our presentation. Uh, as um, Gary said, our team is family of five and we're a group of four NYAD freshmen who are all planning on majoring in computer science. And my name is Abdul Samad and my teammates are Dev, Hassan and Suman. So um, next slide. Uh, so our presentation is broken down into three main categories. The first is the understanding the clues. The second is uh, how we discover the code and the order in which the code is presented. And the third are the supporting evidence we had for um, the code we came out with. Um, so yeah, I'm going to present on understanding the clues. So um, the file was presented in XT format. And since we really didn't know how to work with ST formats, we had to, we had to convert it to um, a format we were more comfortable working in. And those are text files and step files. So we used um, card exchanger to convert uh, the XT file to um, a step file. And then we used Fusion 360 to um, take apart the site. And then we noticed this uh, disturbances within the, um, the pass path. So when it disassembled, these disturbances resembled the, um, the dots and rectangles that the, um, the timing and position patterns you normally see in a QR code. So we inferred that this would definitely have to be a QR code. 
So after numerous field attempts and then uh, attempts at trying to model the QR code that was um, hidden inside the past act, we were able to successfully construct the QR code. And then this was then uh, this kind of QR code. And then after converting to a text file, we saw a hint that led to uh, a Google Drive folder. And that was the same link that the reconstructed QR code uh, led to, to, which is the Google Drive folder you see right here. So that, that provided further supporting evidence for um, our claim that that was the Google Drive folder. And then within the Google Drive folder were two um, images. The first was an image of uh, an Android phone screen lock pattern. And then the second was the actual QR code that we had just scanned. And then the Android screen lock pattern would be used like further clues later on. So I'll then pass it on to uh, Dev who would give the next points. Uh, Dev, you're muted. Sorry. So first of all, we turned it, the whole thing into a glass view. And from there, we could see clearly through, through the keys. If you look at the first key, you'll see a clock as and one first is written here with a reference point. So looking at that, we were able to uh, tell that the clock is pointing to five o'clock. And the one was not only a reference point, but it also meant that this is the first position of the digit, the code. So that meant that this the five would be on the first digit. When we look at the second queue, uh, when we look at the second key, we, we, we were, this was the most interesting one. Cause if you look at it, you see the Jordan flag there and then two basketballs. And one of the basketballs, if you zoom in and if you see from glass view, you'll be able to see three dashes and a dot and then other three dashes. So that we, we, we figured that this could be a Morse code. Look, putting it into an online converter, it came up to be MJ. Now, the first thing that comes to M MJ is a lot of things, but basketball, of course, Michael Jordan. And what is Michael Jordan known for? His iconic jersey number, which is 23. And what, what give, gave us more confidence is because of these two balls. These two balls meant that this uh, represents two digits of the code, the second and the third being two and three. Moving on, when you look at the third key, if you look at the third key, you'll see, you'll see, a tri, uh, you'll see an upside down fourth, which meant that this, the clue of the answer to this represents at the fourth position. And if you look at this, this is ones with dashes and groups of threes. Uh, uh, groups of eight, which meant only one thing, binary. Putting into zeros and ones, we converted it and added up to be the word add. Now add what? So we tried to, after several attempts of figuring out what we could sum up, we figured that if we add all the ones together, it adds up to be nine, which is at the fourth position. Lastly, if you look at the fourth key on the top row, you'll see, you'll see this alchemy thing. Now the fifth grade is, and the interesting part about this is that FIFTH is capitalized, which means at this, the answer to this points out to be at the fifth position. Uh, look, cracking the code rain plus sun gives rainbow. And the first thing that comes to mind from rainbow is seven, because not only does it add up to seven digits, but seven colors. So we could conclude that the seven is at the fifth position. Now uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Sumi to uh, uh, explain more furthermore. Yes, hello, I'm Salman. So now that we have a series of numbers and their positions, we had to find a way to connect them to uh, to find the solution to our five digit code and the order of the key seven of the seven key presses. So the first key was pointing towards the number five and the position first. So so we had an idea that five might be the first position. And then Jordan, uh, Michael Jordan gave us the numbers two and three. So we have three digits now, and the last two keys, they, go, they gave us the number nine and seven with the position fourth and fifth respectively. So now, now that we have the numbers and their positions up to an extent, we had to understand if the keys were scrambled or not in a certain way. But then what we realized was the passcode we have, the passpad we have, it is very similar to the standard number pad that we have in computer keyboards these days. And upon superimposing them, we see the next image, which is the numbers getting aligned the same way. And this also confirmed that our numbers were right because we get the numbers five, two, three, nine, and seven. But now that we have uh, the numbers in their positions as well, we again had to make sure if it was from five to seven or from, or from the seven to the fifth. So I'll pass it to Hassan who will confirm if, uh, confirm the order of our code. Uh, hello guys, I'm Hassan. Uh, thank you so much, Simon. Um, so, uh, my part was, um, 
or uh, if, if we figured out that the fingerprints on the numpad itself were actually from a right-handed person. And we built it up from there and we noticed that if you are right-handed and you do uh, press keys with your right hand, they would form similar dimensions of fingerprints and similar angles as well. Uh, and we, uh, we did a little bit of research on that. We found this really good article, uh, which was about uh, reachability of your finger across a phone screen. And we found that the, 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 the points in the middle of your screen are more reachable compared to the edge, which, uh, which uh, sort of uh, made sense of the pattern we saw in the, in the Android uh, lock screen. Uh, if you see there, we can see that the middle part is really uh, sturdy and solid. And then as you curl around, you're actually uh, going downwards towards the end, towards the top left of the screen, which not only uh, can be explained by your natural wrist movement across the screen, if you are making that uh, type of pattern, but also uh, supported by the, uh, the research that we did, which was like, you know, how it slightly goes lower, how it's harder to reach that top left region. So this kind of confirmed our suspicions that five is the starting number and seven is the ending number because uh, of the way uh, the angles on the fingerprints, uh, they are also changing in a similar fashion. Uh, so yeah, uh, that was- Yes, so, uh, uh, so the it. remaining two keys were the number lock key and the enter key, because if you look at your keyboard again, the, uh, the number lock key has the first light. So, uh, so the first light on the, on the uh, on the device was turned on, which which meant that the number lock key was the first key pressed, and the last key pressed was the enter key to authenticate the passcode entered. So yes, that's how we cracked the key for uh, the final challenge. Thank you very much. We'll be open to any questions now. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any questions from uh, any of the judges that would like to ask? Yeah, so I had a, I had a question. Well, on the um, uh, on the part where you said uh, the 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 fifth tenth, the one that came out to rainbow. Can you tell me again how you got to rainbow? Uh, yes, uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, I can take that. So um, I'm not sure if all of you remember, but then back in the 2013s or 14s, there was this very popular game called uh, Little Alchemy. And, and it was essentially for uh, students, like little kids, fifth graders, sixth graders. So, so that's kind of pointing towards the fifth grade we see there. So in that game, we, we can get elements by mixing other elements. So, so in that game, if you mix air and water, you get rain. If you mix fire and sky, you get sun. So, so using that logic, if you mix sun and rain, you get rainbow. And, and rainbow points towards the colors vip gear, which is again seven. Okay. So yeah, even in the game, rain and sun means rainbow. So that's okay. how we got the colors of rainbow. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so when you were doing the fingerprint analysis, um, you talked about uh, they were right-handed. Um, did you analyze each fingerprint to determine which, uh, if there were duplicate? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, so what uh, what I did um, was we took we took each 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 fingerprint from here. We took a snippet of it. We took it to a graphic software and we traced it. We traced it and tried to overlay it on top of one another. And they were almost identical in most poses because even if you rotate it, uh, we tried to figure out if the fingerprints were different, but uh, we, uh, it ended up being the exact uh, same, uh, except uh, some places the thickness could change because if you look at the top of the tip, or the bottom of the tip, but the, the layout was completely uh, same. So we tried to overlay them uh, by tracing it uh, and they were indeed same. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna dig into that one more step. So did you guys determine anything based on like the angle that they were pressed? Um, uh, I, can, I can take that one. 
uh, the, the angle in which they were pressed, uh, we talked about it, you know, naturally how a right-handed person would, you know, press a keyboard. And uh, from what we kind of inferred from that is uh, the, the, from the angle in which uh, the fingerprints are formed, it would be uh, similar to the way the phone pattern unlock has been made. You know, like, uh, like for example, if your first key was in the corner, for example, you try to, you know, make us like a, make a straight fingerprint on the top left key, for example, but you see it's angled. So if you like type quickly, you know, you, you kind of naturally form that angle in if you go from that motion. So th that was the, the type of analysis that we did uh, that the right hand would, you know, move in that form. So, yeah, thank you. And a small addition to that point, there uh, like we made sure that there is no way that those fingers, uh, those prints could have been made by the right hand because if you try making fingerprints with the, uh, I mean sorry, left hand because if you try making those prints with the left hand, the angle would be tilted towards the right instead of the left. So the tilt was uh, a way for us to make sure that it's with the right hand. In addition to the points Hassan said about the wrist movement. Thank you so much, family, Dr. Yor. And next, uh, uh, for student team, we have uh, Team Pizza. So Team Pizza, would you please uh, prepare for your presentation? Yep, uh, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. I believe everyone's ready. Okay. Good morning. Uh, okay. Yeah, should I start? Yeah. Uh, good morning. Today, my team Pizza is here to do a presentation for the Hack 3D Finals Pin Skimming for Fun and Profit. Uh, my teammates are Ish Mehdi, Anjali Singhal, Jeffrey, and Shakil. Next, please. Code. Uh, like what we, the code actually what we found was 52397. Uh, what we did basically was firstly, the numpad given to us would match the standard keypad found on an American keyboard. However, a wireframe view allowed us to access hidden clues that led to uh, the order of digits. The digits themselves were immediately found since the fingerprints were visible on the keys. We opened the models in Autodesk, Autodesk SolidWorks and performed the cursory overview of the case as well as the depth section analysis. The numbers were the, basically the keys what we found were the digits 23579, numlock and enter key. So we deduced that firstly the user pressed the numlock, then the digits in the order 52397, and then the enter key. The, we applied various logics to reduce this pin 52397. Here now in the next slide, it will be shown all our logics. So the first clue we had was the clock. Um, and so uh, looking at the clock, we know it's the first clue uh, simply be, uh, because all the other clues had digits associated with them. Uh, and in this one, we couldn't exactly quite find uh, what, what place it would be, but uh, by the process of elimination, we figured out that the clock was going to be the first digit. Um, and so with the clock, uh, it has two different orientations depending on its perspective. Um, so we have the either the five o'clock or the seven o'clock. So, and so we either took the digits five or seven and we kept them in mind uh, just in case. Uh, and so we had these two digits and we found out later that the digit is in fact five because the seven is used later on in, a, in, in another clue. Uh, so so uh, for the second clue, we had the, uh, the Morse code uh, and it like originally we translated it to JM. Um, it could also be reversed to MJ. And uh, at first when we had JM, we were uh, slightly a bit confused because you know two initials weren't really enough for us to uh, get any number from it. Um, however, we quickly realized that the third clue was um, also on the same key on the number pad. So we decided to combine the clues, perhaps they were related. So um, the third clue, as you can see, is the flag of Jordan. And so we initially thought JM stood for Jamaica and Jordan uh, as, as the country. Um, since uh, most of our teams uh, are, are, don't actually watch basketball as much as I guess the rest of uh, America does. So we were a bit puzzled there. And then we quickly, uh, while we were Googling Jamaica and Jordan, we found the Jordans, the sneakers. 
and we were like, wow, Michael Jordan, of course, that's who has, who has to be. And um, so the Jordan flag and plus the MJ uh, acronym uh, is Michael Jordan. And he's uh, known for having the 23 number on his jersey. He also has the number 45, at, I believe, after retirement. But the number four is not a candidate uh, for us. Um, so uh, we, be, we were very confident that the second and uh, second digit was two and the third digit was three. Uh, Shaquille? I think you're muted. Okay, there you go. No, you're, you're good, you're good. Yeah. Oh, we can't, we can't hear you, it seems. Uh, it's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll fill in for you, Shaquille, don't worry. Um, so uh, our fourth clue was the binary string as well. Uh, we know it's the fourth clue because uh, next, oh, are you back in? Okay. okay. So we know it's the fourth clue because uh, uh, the number the, 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 uh, there's, uh, there's a clue that just says fourth right next to it. Um, and so when the binary digits are in, like, so if you notice that they're uh, spliced up into three, uh, three different sections. And so when we take each section and we convert it to ASCII, we get the word add. And so we added up all the, all the digits that we could see, which are the ones, and we, get it, we ended up getting nine. So we know that the fourth digit was nine. So uh, the last one is the fifth clue, which is uh, fifth grade uh, alchemy. And so we know it's the fifth clue because it says fifth on it. Um, and so we, when we initially look at it, we see one zero zero one, and that actually converts to nine uh, in, uh, in decimal. Uh, however, we, see, uh, we didn't solve the rest of the puzzle. So we decided to go see what more we could find. And uh, also we realized that uh, it followed the game of Little Alchemy. So we just inserted the combinations into the game of Little Alchemy and we figured out that the uh, rain plus sun gives us a rainbow. And so the, 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 the two numbers we lower digits, we have our nine and seven, but since nine was already used for the fourth clue, we knew that the digit was seven. Um, also, uh, the, the, when we solve the QR code, we later find out, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. So, yeah. so um, inside the, uh, the file, we found a, a hint in the metadata and the hint leads to a Google Drive folder where you see the um, pattern unlock screen on the left and a QR code on the right. So the pattern unlock screen sort of suggests that the pattern, uh, the sequence is either five, two, three, nine, seven, or seven, nine, three, two, five, depending on which way the pattern is drawn. And the QR code is also significant um, because as we'll see on the next slide, So the QR code we found fragments of in the um, model file, and we reconstructed it by putting it together. Um, initially, it didn't scan very well. So what we did was we um, used a spreadsheet software and sort of filled in cells on the spreadsheet until we had something that looked uh, a lot neater. And then it scans to um, give the same link as before. And so that was um, really convincing for us that that would be the sequence. So uh, in conclusion, the uh, the number code we uh, decided on that was the answer was five two three nine seven, and then the order was again. So first we said the number lock, uh, then the digits for the code, and then enter. And the number lock is first because in order to use most uh, standard num uh, standard number pads, you need to have the number lock number lock uh, click key pressed, uh, and then you click the digits, and then you press enter to submit the um, uh, so submit your code. Uh, in addition, the, the lock screen hint confirms that uh, that it is that code because we know that either the first or last digit has to be either a five or a seven. Uh, and our first digit is indeed a five. And so our last digit is indeed a seven. And it also follows that pattern as Jeffrey mentioned. In addition, while uh, solving these puzzles, we, we said that uh, in order to like uh, have a groundwork to base off of, we said that, um, that we, uh, the number pad we use would be the standard American number pad so that um, we have something to work with. We also said that we wouldn't reuse digits and things like that, or the all the digits are going to be used simply because we wanted uh, some groundwork to work off of and to not and to not make like wild theories. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, Team Q's presentation. Uh, we'll take questions now.
Hello, were you able to discern anything from the fingerprints? For the fingerprints themselves, we just only discerned uh, the keys that were pressed. Um, and we, I guess, subconsciously assumed a right-handed uh, fingerprint uh, simply because it was, uh, I guess, most of us are very dominant with our right hand. Okay, thank you. Um, so back at the beginning, you guys talked about that the clock could either be five or seven. When did you guys realize that it was a five? So um, uh, basically when we solved the last, uh, la the fifth clue, so the fifth clue we decided was either a nine or a seven. And so uh, the, the fifth clue ended up being a seven. So we said that the first, uh, the clock must be a five just by uh, elimination. So it's kind of like playing Sudoku. Yeah, kind of, kind of like that pretty, pretty much. You started off in the beginning saying uh, it was based on a US keyboard or keypad. How did you know that? Uh, so like, that was what's one of the things we like we because we needed like some place to work off from we 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 set it as it's kind of like an axiom like uh, this is a US standard keyboard and it, it did match the, the original like we we did um we did we did take the keyboard and uh, made it uh, match with the, the standard keyboard and it did match and since we needed some place to start from we said uh, we'll, we'll consider this to be true until we're proven false that's okay. how we did it. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Team Pizza, for your presentation. Uh, moving on next, we have uh, Team Factor. Hello, guys. Uh, I'm Mohit from Team Vector, and I'll be uh, telling you my approach to the solution to this challenge. So starting off, I'll be telling you the solution to the challenge, followed by how I got to the solution, uh, following the way in which I solved the bonus challenge, and all the approaches I followed. Let's begin. So the first, uh, first let's start off with the solution. Uh, comparing the given model to the numeric uh, numpad on the keyboard, I just assumed it had to be it. So I went with it just as a trial and error method. So uh, comparing it, uh, I mapped each key to the keyboard and figured out that the letters, I mean, the keys that were pressed were numlock, five, two, three, nine, seven, and enter. So uh, this is the final solution that I have proposed that uh, the first key that would be pressed is numlock because uh, uh, that would basically be the first point like to enable numeric inputs, you need to switch that on. Plus you also had a green light popping in from the first LED. So that had to be the first one. And it's pretty obvious the last digit would be the enter key since you need to press that for the system to register your password. So the answer, the pin that I found out was uh, 52397. So we look into how I got to that. Uh, so the first clue I discovered was of the clock. So uh, I found the characters first uh, mentioned in the clue. So orienting it to that position, uh, the clock would be oriented uh, as shown in the figure in the left. So that reads five. So I, I, I had to assume it's the number five. So since it's the first, uh, the first, the character's first is written. So I had to assume it's the first uh, digit in the five digit pin. So if you observe the top right corner, I'll be uh, adding the digits one by one. So the next clue is uh, from the basketball. So there was a Morse code uh, embedded in a basketball. So if you translate the Morse into English characters, you get the letters M and J. So it had to be Michael Jordan. So a quick Google search and uh, I found out his jersey number was 23. So I quickly added that to the pin. So that's how I, I, I arrived at five, two and three. 
Uh, following that, uh, the next clue is the binary instruction. Since the digits were in packets of eight, I assumed they were binary. So uh, a quick binary to English character trans translation, uh, I got the letters ADD. Uh, so the first thing I could think of was to add all the numbers there, uh, which gave me to the sum of nine. So I added that to, I added nine as the next digit of the pin. Uh, so up to now I had the uh, digits as five, two, three, and nine. And the only letter left to be uh, punched in was seven. So I added that as the final uh, digit. Also, uh, in the previous clue, uh, if you try to convert the uh, binary to decimal and add them up, uh, you get the answer to be 297, which is confusing at the beginning. But uh, after solving the bonus challenge, I figured that it couldn't be uh, that. So the final answer had to be 5, 2, 3, and 9. Uh, so moving on to how I solved the bonus challenge. Uh, the figure in the left shows the picture that was uh, in the Google Drive folder uh, you arrive at after scanning the QR code. So I tried uh, arranging all the layers together, which was uh, hard to scan. So I thought of manually, uh, you know, arranging all the dots in place and uh, come up with a QR code myself. So I prepared a 25 cross 25 grid and started filling in all the dots. So on the right is the QR code I came up with. The trick I used was simple. Uh, the two rectangles uh, that I have marked are the key characters that, I mean, the trait that defines the QR code. It had to be in alternate colors. So using that trick, I was able to construct the QR code. And upon scanning it, uh, I arrived that the uh, Google link, a Google Drive link, I mean the folder containing the two files. So that is how I solved the bonus challenge. So next up, uh, I'd like to discuss the approaches I followed. I mean, the key principles I followed. Uh, first of all, I started listing out all the visual cues by clues by scanning through the model. So I went through all the cross sections and uh, each and every button to find out uh, if there's anything under them or inside them using uh, inbuilt tools to come up with uh, clues. And next, I started picking on each clue and uh, trying to figure out, I mean, I tried to figure out what it represents. Uh, if, is it some encrypted code or uh, does it mean something? So I tried doing that. Uh, next, if that doesn't work out, I make an assumption that it could be that number. For example, uh, uh, the failed version of, uh, uh, you know, the, the one where two and three were interchanged. There I assumed uh, the second digit to be three. So I tried uh, like figuring out a way in which the basketball uh, made sense, like, how it could represent three. So that is one uh, approach I went through. Though it didn't work out, but uh, it was one of the ways I looked into the problem. And the final one would be to look for non-visual clues, uh, like the dimension of uh, certain objects or bodies or properties. It could be color, it could be the orientation, et cetera. So this is how I tried solving the problem and uh, arrived at the solution. Uh, Thank you, that'll be it. Now I'll be taking questions. Can you tell me again how you got to the um, seven on the rainbow? Yeah, I didn't actually figure that throughout. So uh, by eliminating all other, uh, you know, the other digits, I arrived at, uh, I mean, the only one left would be seven, right? Uh, the other four digits were already in place, so. But how did you know that seven, how did you know that those were the numbers? Uh, I uh, mapped the keys with the numpad on my keyboard. Okay, 
Gotcha. Right. From the finger bridge. Okay. Thanks. Um, can you talk a little more about how you got to the, the URL? How did you initially find that? Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, I scanned the QR code basically. So okay. after constructing the QR code, I scanned it. Uh, it landed to a web link uh, is period gd slash iz 2 f 8 e uh, it's redirected to the google drive folder okay to add to that question uh prior to inputting all of the information into x in your 20 by 20 25 by 25 excel sheet uh in the original uh design file did you had to first overlay those different segments of QR codes together, or you just viewed it individually uh, to input it into the Excel sheet one by one? Uh, I tried that. I tried doing that uh, in the software, Autodesk software. Uh, it didn't work out, so I manually counted and uh, placed each dot in its place. OK, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions from the judges? Which institution are you from? Uh, I'm from NIE, my sir. My sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Team Vector. And uh, after Team Vector, we have a Team Solid VS code. Is my screen visible? Yes. Yep, you're good to go. Uh, yeah, so I asked Caleb to start with the presentation. Yep. So my name is Caleb Beckwith. We are Team Solid VS Code. With me today are my teammates, Harsh Nyker, uh, Savra Mehta, and Sarah Xiao. Uh, this is uh, uh, Harsh, if you can move to the next slide. So this is our approach that we went through in order to find the uh, the the code. So first we saw that we had seven fingerprints, and then inside some of the keys we found different hints. And so the first one that we found was a clock. Then we found the two basketballs, one with the flag, one with the Morse code. Then after that we found some weird numbering pattern that we determined to be binary. Then we found the fifth grade alchemy class, and then lastly, as it was listed as a bonus challenge we found the uh, uh, little shambles that turned out to be a QR code. So if you can move on again. Okay, so we first opened up the file and we saw you know, what you're looking at. It's just a, a keypad or the PassPad 6000 uh, with a bunch of different fingerprints on it. And we determined that layout to be the same as a, uh, you know, just a regular keypad. And actually, I figured that out when I looked down at my keypad, and I saw that the keys were in the same place. And so from there, we were able to determine that the keys pressed were the numlock, the seven, nine, five, three, two, and the enter and the enter uh, button. Uh, and so we immediately were able to rule out numlock and enter because in order to get the uh, keypad to actually do anything, you have to have the numlock engaged. And then the enter key is obviously what you use to enter something. So there you go. Uh, so for the first clue, we found that there was a clock. And at first, we weren't really sure what this was. We sort of looked at it from a bunch of different orientations. The first thing that we thought was um, it was 1030, because we were looking at it upside down. <laughs> Um, but then we noticed that the clue, or rather the, um, the first, to indicate that it's the first one that we're supposed to be looking at, uh, was in the same position as a one on a regular clock. So from there, we sort of rotated it 180 degrees, and we found uh, five, uh, 5 p.m., or a.m., whichever one, uh, to be the, uh, you know, to just be what it is. And so we determined that five was our first number. 
So moving on to numbers two and three, they were hidden underneath the same key, which is the forward slash. Um, this one was really tricky. To be completely honest, we started with number three and then we went back to number two. Uh, for number three, when we looked at this flag at first, I saw the triangle and then I saw stripes and I saw a star and I, um, my first thought was not the flag of Jordan, but rather we thought it was the Puerto Rican flag. <laughs> and that was so bad because we it led us down the, a rabbit hole. We found an article about the Puerto Rican team winning at the Olympics, uh, 92 to 73, um, which are all the remaining numbers that we would have had. Uh, so we we worked off of that assumption for a while and then we found uh, hints four and five made sure that that did not line up at all so we had to go back to the drawing board uh the next morning and we re-examined the flag we found that it had seven points on the star rather than five and it had three stripes rather than five so we we from there we determined that it was the flag of jordan now naturally the flag of jordan plus a basketball doesn't mean much however in the next clue uh, it sort of pieced itself together. We found um, in the second hint, the Morse code for M and J. And in this orientation, you can see where it says M first and then J second. Um, and, and from there, we figured basketballs, M, J, Jordan, Michael Jordan. Uh, so that led us to uh, and, and of course, Michael Jordan played for the Chicago Bulls as number 23 before he became number 45 relatively recently. Um, 23 is what he became famous as. So we, we went with uh, Michael Jordan, number 23, 23, 23 are our numbers. So we currently have five, two, three as our numbers. And now I will pass it off to Savara, uh, who will be explaining the next two hints to you. Um, yeah, thank you, Caleb. Um, so for the third, uh, in third key, when we looked closely, we found the number fourth engraved. Um, so we realized that in the logical order, it's the fourth digit of the five digit pin code. And um, naturally we found the binary code. Um, at first we were wondering um, if we should convert it to decimal and then sort of try to add the numbers up. but um, as luck had it, we actually converted into ASCII and it converted into the text add. Uh, we successively added each of the binary codes, um, converted into 9700, which gave us 297. And on successively adding it, we got the digit nine. Um, that is the way we got nine as the fourth digit. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is the last key that we had in the first row. Um, which had fifth in block letters, which meant the fifth um, pin code, the fifth digit of the pin code. Um, for alchemy, we actually went to Little Alchemy and we did a walkthrough of six equations that gave us a rainbow. So the equations were air plus water is rain, fire plus water is steam, air plus steam is cloud, air plus cloud is sky, fire plus sky is sun, and rain plus sun is rainbow. So that is the way we uh, bifurcated it. And um, that is how we got it as rainbow towards the end. And um, rainbow has Vibgyor, which is seven colors, which is how we came up with the number seven as the last code. Um, so I will pass it on to Harsh now. So as uh, Swara already mentioned, we have the five keys of our passcode which are uh, 52397 in that order. But we also had the QR code, which we knew that we had to reconstruct. So we had our approach pretty much laid out for us. So we knew that we would have to align the three squares that form the three corners of the QR code and the two patterns together. But it would be a little bit of a hassle to do it in uh, any of the CAD softwares. So our approach was to first find out the dimensions of the QR code. So you have the standard dimensions. You are 25 cross 25 or 29 cross 29 or 33 cross 33. So we counted, uh, we just picked one of the two patterns and we saw that it would form a 25 cross 25 QR code. So we went on to, uh, so our approach was to uh, start up an Excel sheet, plot all the points. So first what we did was to 
uh, start up the Excel sheet, plot the three squares. And as you can see on the left side, we first plotted the first pattern. And then our uh, next step was to superimpose the second pattern on the same Excel sheet. So uh, we sort of followed it vertically on every side and we plotted the entire uh, pattern, which gave us the complete QR code. And now it became scannable. So uh, when you scan the QR code, you get the link, uh, the smaller link, which actually redirects to your uh, Google Drive link, which is containing uh, your, the actual uh, pick of the QR code and also an Android unlock pattern. Now, uh, as we have already maintained the flow that with the fingerprints in the beginning and the keypad, we already knew what the potential number was with the five keys that in the top that the four keys in the top that we followed, we knew the correct sequence, but the bonus task looking at this unlock pattern, it sort of gave us a hint to actually go back and see probably uh, to reconfirm the order. So as you can see over here, the swipe pattern, if you kind of compare it to your numpad again, you can see that it can be either five, two, three, uh, nine, seven, or it could also be seven, nine, three, two, five. Right. So, uh, since we already had the previous clues and that in addendum to our, um, the Android unlock pattern, we confirmed that the sequence that we have arrived at with our approach so far is the correct one. And so finally, our conclusion was that the five digit pin pass code is indeed five, two, three, nine, seven in that order. And the correct order in which the seven keys were pressed is numlock five, two, three, nine, seven and enter. So, uh, that is the gist of our entire approach and we thank you all for your time and we are open to questions. If there are any, thank you so much. If I may say one thing before we take any questions, I would like to give a special thanks to our uh, fourth teammate, Sarah Xiao. Uh, she had surgery kind of recently, and it makes it hard for her to see. Uh, so she uh, insisted on helping us, but we we tried to do our best to make sure that she rested and recovered. Uh, so once again, thank a uh, special thank you to Sarah. To Sarah. And now uh, any questions that you guys have? Yes. Uh, did you discover anything about the fingerprints? So we were not able to really see if there was any biometrics at play. So aside from the fact that the fingerprints were pressed down, the um, we didn't really give it much uh, much thought. Uh, I guess you could say that the the uh, it makes a right hand because you know most numpads are on the right side of a keyboard. But aside from that, no, not really. Regarding that, we had another uh, theory that probably the small triangles that you have inside each key, probably they would differ in height. So we sort of investigated during smart dimension, the height of every uh, triangle, uh, because we thought that probably uh, the relative heights of the triangles would give us the order, but we never came down to uh, look for the depth or the heights of the fingerprints or anything. So we sort of missed over there. Probably if we had given more thought, we would have come down to the fingerprints as well. Anyone else have any questions? So on the QR code, did you say that you manually put it into a spreadsheet or how did you combine that? Yeah, we so that one was that one was uh, another thing that was kind of awful. Um, so I, I had opened Excel because, you know, uh, in in the previous um, weeks of our summer program, we, we were given a QR code related challenge. And the best way to solve it was to manually input it into Excel. So we we once again repeated that process. And you know, at first, I when I was doing it, I thought it was a 29 by 29. So it wound up a little too large. So I had to scale it back down. <laughs> and uh, from there, we uh, got the first one in, and then we super uh, put the second one in. Okay. Thank you, Team Solid DS Code. Thank you, Miss. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, next up, we have uh, Team 3D AD. Hello, good afternoon. We are Team 3D AD, and today we'll be presenting about how we solve the Hack 3D final challenge. The overview of our presentation is going to be this way. We're going to discuss how we got a five-digit pin, and then we discuss how 
how the seven characters were input, and then we, did, we discussed other methods that we considered. So what we did was we first imported our model into SOLIDWORKS, and then when we put it into SOLIDWORKS, we viewed it using lines and hidden lines. And what we found were five ordinal numbers. That's all of the number. So because it was from first to fifth, we, we concluded that that was going to be um, the position. Every every, the, every clue was going to tell us about the position, um, the number in the position. So the first clue, the first clue was the clock, and the clock was the hands of the clock were pointing to five o'clock. We concluded that we were pointing to five o'clock by just aligning the first so that it's in the second clue and the third clue. The interesting thing about it was that it was in the same key. So because we were in the same key, we assumed that they were going to be related to each other. The second key, the second clue was a basketball. And inside the basketball, we had um, some Morse code. We had dash dash, which stands for M, and then dot dash dash dash, which was J. So combined this MJ. The third clue was the flag of Jordan. It was, it was also, um, in the form of a basketball. That's the ordinal number was in the form of a basketball. So from there, we were able to relate that the, because we um, we said the um, second clue and the third clue were in the same key and they are, um, re they are related to each other, we were able to combine that to form Michael Jordan. And we know Michael Jordan wore the number 23. The fourth clue was, um, um, three strings of eight bit um, binary numbers. So the interesting thing about this is that when you form the binary numbers and then you change it to decimal, add all the digits in 297, you're going to have 18. And when you add all the digits in 18, you're going to have nine. And this was further confirmed by the fact that we added just because of that, we we're able to um, know that it's going to be nine. So for the fifth clue, it was an alchemy combination question. And for this, we researched online and we found that when you add rain and sun, you're going to have rainbow. And we the rainbow has seven letters and it also has seven colors. So initially, we um, went through some um, different iterations of um, what we thought should be, which we'll discuss later. We also um, looked at a, a, the file in a, a text editor and straight off the bat, we just realized that in the header, there was um, a hint over there. So we followed this hint and we put it into our browser and it led to a Google Drive folder. In a Google Drive folder, there was a pattern and then there was a QR code, which I'm going to talk about later. But then when we look at just the pattern, we realized that the, um, the green direction, and it, told, it tells us about the path and then the direction of the, the, and the way in which the numbers were input. So it's either we start from seven and end at five, that's if we go clockwise, or we start at five and end at seven. But then because our first clue was a clock that pointed to five o'clock, we um, decided to we decided that it's going to start at five. So for the first, the first method that we tried in order to find the code was that we just looked at the number of alphabets in each of the clues. So for example, in the first clue, it was a clock, the clock has five letters, MJ has two letters, and then the flag was a Jordanian flag, which had nine letters, add had three letters, and rainbow has seven letters. So the, when we combine them, we have five, two, nine, three, seven. But then the problem with this was that it didn't follow the Android pattern. So because of that, we um, dropped it, and then we looked at the clues in context. That's the clock is pointing at five o'clock, MJ and a Jordan flag, because we said they were in the same key, they are related to each other, which means 23 makes more sense. And adding all the ones in the fourth clue gave us nine. At the same time, adding, changing to decimal and adding everything still gave us nine. A rainbow has seven colors. And then from there, we're able to combine that and get a code 52397. And this matched the pattern on the Android, um, the Android picture. So we, um, we are confident that this was the correct answer. So moving on to the order in which the key, the seven keys were pressed. We compared the given model to a standard uh, keyboard keypad and we found that they had the same layout. So we therefore deduced that we could map the key functions for the standard keypad to the given model. Next slide. Also, um, we deduce the required order to be uh, the required order of the key presses to be num lock, then the pin, which we found 52397, and then the enter key. Um, we were given that uh, seven keys were pressed and we have only seven fingerprints, so that made sense. We also checked each key to ensure that there were no repeated digits and found that to be the case by checking that there are no fingerprints overlap on any of the key. Finally, we overlapped all fingerprints and found them to be exactly the same, uh, meaning that they were from the same person. 
And specifically, um, they were from a right hand, uh, and we deduced this from the delta region of the fingerprints. Um, so from the indicators, uh, the indicator you see on the screen, which was at the top of the given model, we see that the given, uh, that given our mapping from the standard keypad, um, the lead led in green represents the norm log key indicator. So we were also told that the pin is five digits, meaning numerics, so digits meaning numerics. Therefore, the norm log was entered first to restrict the entry to numeric digits only or to numeric or digits only. Then the pin we found um, above was pressed and then the enter key was pressed to verify the pin. Now I'm gonna explain how we reconstructed the QR code and, and at, first, at a first view of the model, we can see different clouds of objects that cluster together. And conveniently, those clouds of objects also each group, it consists of several spheres that are sort of aligning in the same plane. So, so the way to extract those features first is, is to, what we did is we compute the centroid of three of the spheres. With that, we can plot a plane that is coplanar to the centroid of all the spheres. And, and then we can align the view and extract, the, extract that view from those, from, from, from those spheres. That way we make sure that we're looking at the spheres in the right angle because they're, they were all coplanar, they're centroids. The, um, so these are the, the, the set of structures that we can extract. Now, we still have to rotate them. And that is easy because uh, thankfully, we, the, the guide marks that QR code includes uh, help us to, 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 to align them in the, in, a, in the same orientation. But then still, we don't know if, if one of them, we're looking, if we're looking them from the front or from the back. And then if we mix that, we cannot reconstruct the code. So we had to make several iterations. Thankfully, we only need to make one iteration of that because, because it's enough to, to rotate one of them to look it from the back and then, and then cluster them together. And, uh, and one of the two options need to, need to coincide with a QR code. When we try to read the reconstructed code using just that with a, with a, with a, with a, with a, with a QR code reader, we get automatically a link that happens to be identical to the to the link that was in the hint header in the in the original uh, object file, and that it's also identical to the DXF file that it's inside of the Google Drive that is directed to this link. The um, uh, maybe something important about this QR code is that even though even though it 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 comprises it's consistent with the specification for 30% error correction the the error that means that you can you you can you you can cut off 30% of the qr code and still can read it the the way the the two features were the, disassembled ensured the way that you cannot read the qr code by only looking at one the since it's like randomly selecting what what are the ones that were subtracted the, um, and this is the information we have about the QR code. So based on the evidence that we've got it, and thus far, we concluded that the five digit code was 52397. And the order in which they were input is that there was the num log first, and then 52397, and then enter. And the QR code, we're confident that that was a QR code that um, was required because it's um, linked us to the same Google Drive file that we found in the um, header file, in, in the header of the um, X, um, XT file. So yeah, thank you. Now we're open for your questions. Thank you, team uh, 3DAD. Uh, in terms of working together in a team, uh, between all the different uh, clues and challenges, uh, was there any particular that gave the team uh, uh, the most difficulty? Well, I, I think something that we did correctly at the start was to avoid working together in the first few hours of the challenge. That made sure that we had like like a French uh, a fresh point of view on, on on what the probable hidden clues were, and uh, and we avoided like biasing uh, ourselves. 
and that also helped us very quickly to like when we gathered to gather together we we had already already checked very different things from the models and very quickly we we came to we came very quickly to 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 the solution then we spent some time looking for other things looking for ways to interpret the data that that would also give the same result so so to sort of like reinforce the decision that we've made the um, and uh, I, th I think where we spent most the time was was probably was probably in the like maybe the, the not so obvious so the ones that were not like clearly stated or or, or perhaps the the more obvious the, the last thing that we saw was that the led was turned on and that meant that the block num the numeric lock was hit and of course we, we did use that from the start but then we didn't make the association that was like directly evident in the in in the first view of the model the, um, okay. yeah. thank you so thank you team uh, 3d ad thank you and moving on to our next presentation we have uh, team the pc squad yeah, is my voice audible Yes. Okay, I'll be sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah. Are you so able greeting to, see or, greeting to Yeah, I can see. It. Okay, got you. Yeah. So greeting to all the judges and participants present today. Our team, the PC squad, comprising of Varun, Sukpal, Nia, and myself Harsh, will present you our approach to the solution of this year's Hack 3D final challenge. Before that, I would like to give you a brief description on the challenge given to us. So in this image, you can see that we have been provided with a digital twin keypad, which provides real time data and someone has entered seven keys on it. So our main task is to obtain these seven keys and also obtain a five digit uh, pin passcode, which has been entered by them. Next slide, please. So, the, so basically the overview of our approach is that we first visualize the model using a CAD software, the CAD software, which was used by us was Fusion 360. Then we solve the puzzles embedded in the subsequent pads. Uh, there were four pads provided to us and each pad was associated with digits of the pin passcode. After that, we had reconstructed the QR, QR code to ensure that the op, uh, passcode obtained by the pads uh, were correct or not. So the passcode which we got was five, two, three, nine, and seven. In addition to this, we had also cracked the final clue, which will be explained by my team members in the uh, presentation afterwards. Uh, now I'll pass it over to Nia. Right. So in general, there are four paths. Um, starting with the first one, as I've uh, circled up here on the top left, please, so Paul. Um, so looking closely uh, using wireframe view, we see that there's a clock and a miniature first uh, on the peripheral. So looking at the correct orientation of first, we get the position of the clock that points to five o'clock. So um, based on this alone, we um, can already guess that the first position of the pin should be number five, but we have no way of uh, being sure yet. So please do next slide. So five o'clock, first indicates that the first pin should be a five. Um, next one, please. So secondly, as you can see, the second pad, which is right next to it, um, please. So within it, we see that there's a flag and also two basketballs. So um, looking at the flag, you see that there's a seven point star. Uh, doing a quick Google search, we can identify that it's the flag of Jordan. And looking at the two basketballs, one of them was completely normal, but the other one had a more interesting feature, which on the next slide, please, we can see that there is a Morse code in uh, the middle. Um, translating those Morse code gives us MJ. So what does Jordan, MJ, and basketball have to do with, you know, anything? Um, as a lot of uh, the other team has already decoded, is Michael Jordan, and uh, we decoded that it is, um, the number associated with Michael Jordan should be 23. Um, again, there's also 
another a couple more numbers, but um, honestly, Michael Jordan is most uh, famous for his 23 uh, jersey. So we went with that. And so combine that uh, those clues, we get MJ. No, uh, uh, combine those clues, we get um, 23. And also the two basketball uh, kind of represents that it should be on the second position, so on. So we decided that the second and third pin should be two and three. And uh, next to the, is the third pad, as you can see, it is next to the second one, which in the middle has, next slide, please, um, a line of binary code and a number four fourth at the base of the triangle. So the, uh, the binary code was very straightforward. We just uh, substitute the empty spaces for zeros. And using a um, online decoder, we just uh, converted it to ASCII, which translates to add. And by adding all the ones together, we get the number nine. Combined with the fourth position, as the fourth at the, at the base indicates, we get that the fourth pin should be nine. So, so far we have five, two, three, nine. And based on the, uh, the fingerprints alone, we can deduce that the last one is seven. However, we will also decode that as well. Please sit, Paul. So talking about the fourth keypad, uh, we can see it in the first row all the way to the upper right. If we look closer, uh, there is a feature that's embedded in it, and it's the fifth grade alchemy. Uh, so we have air plus water equals rain, fire plus sky equals sun, and then rain plus sun equals question mark. So for us, uh, like the other teams had mentioned that there is a game, a fifth grade alchemy game that uh, we didn't really know of. So we um, went with our um, like personal experiences. If you guys ever experienced like a rain shower while it was sunny, usually most of the time at the end, there's always a rainbow. So personally, we guessed that rain plus sun equals rainbow. And with rainbow, there is uh, seven colors usually in a rainbow. And um, since the fifth was all capitalized, we um, it was indicated that the fifth digit of the passcode is um, would be seven. So therefore, we arrive at the code five, two, three, nine, and seven. And the next section is going to be the meaning of the buttons. Um, so if you look at uh, a traditional keyboard, um, um, like the one in front of you, or just an older keyboard, um, there are usually three dots on top um, that usually light up. Uh, for the upper left one is usually the num lock, and then the middle one is a cap lock, and then all the way to the right would uh, usually be the scroll lock. Um, and if you look at a traditional um, keyboard, such as this one, um, we know that uh, the, upper, the upper left button in the first row is usually the num lock, and then the middle section usually has numbers, and then um, uh, bottom right is gonna be the enter. So uh, this allowed us to, um, the number on the, uh, the light on the keypad, the green light on the keypad that was given to us, um, it, it suggested that uh, the, the num lock was activated or enabled. So this allowed us to guess the sequence of the buttons pressed. So it was going to be the num lock first, and then the numbers five, two, three, nine, and seven, and then the enter button would be last. Yeah, so the bonus part of the challenge uh, required us to construct, reconstruct a broken QR code, which had several components of it spread across the model. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see, uh, the, QR uh, the QR code, had, there were two clusters of spheres and there were missing uh, squares inside the QR code. So we used a tried and tested method to like use uh, a Google Sheets to re to create a grid and and uh, recreate the QR code where each sphere represents a black cell, a black colored cell. Uh, next slide. So when you combine these two uh, these two QR codes, uh, you get uh, the final QR code, which upon scanning uh, gives us a drive link. Uh, next slide.
So the so the drive link consisted of two images. The the one on the right was the exact same QR code which we had uh, already scanned, while the while the image on the left uh, is is a pattern pattern of numbers. We didn't initially know what that meant until we had actually found the pat uh, found the sequence of the digits through uh, other heads. Next ne next slide. So as you can see, after after we had actually uh, found out, uh, uh, predicted the sequence of the digits. The pattern, the pattern shown here follows the same sequence from five, two, three, nine, and seven. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, moving to the final clue. So the final clue was actually hidden in the fingerprints itself. So as you can see here, we have calculated the the depth or the the depth of the fingerprints like uh, how how much have they been extruded so as you can see one of the fingerprints was uh, 5 and 10 to the power minus 5 meters in meters in length and the other fingerprints had had dimensions as shown here so the numlock had the 9 followed by 5 2 3 uh, 5 2 3 9 7 and enter so, so in the decrease, if you see, it's it's kind of a decreasing sequence, and it, it, this is the same sequence of digits that we had found earlier. So it kind of uh, it confirms our prediction uh, for the sequence of the digits. Yeah, thank. That's all, all from my side. Thank you, team at the PC Squad. We have time for one or two questions from the judges. Okay, if there's uh, no questions, then uh, thank you so much, Team PC Squad. Uh, next, the judges will have a judge deliber uh, deliberation meeting uh, offline, and I'd like to pass it over to uh, Nick, uh, Professor Nikhil Gupta to introduce our keynote speaker during this time. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Srini, I can see you are here. Can we do a quick mic check with you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you maybe also see me? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, I'll share my screen. As judges go to the deliberation, and uh, we had a fantastic batch of uh, six finalists today who presented. Uh, so we have a keynote speaker today for the next round. Of and the topic for the talk today is 100 reasons to be a scientist. Now, the speaker is Professor Katepali Srinivasan, and he's, he's very famous in scientific community. Professor Srinivasan is a university professor at NYU, and he was the dean of the NYU Tandon School of Engineering from 2013 to 2018. Uh, he, he's an elected member of the US National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, and a number of different countries' national academies. His list of awards and honors is too long to include here, but some of which were listed and circulated with his bio. Uh, so he compiled a book some time ago. It's a collection of essays you know, from eminent people <clears throat> about 100 reasons to be a scientist. I think the book is published by the Norwegian Academy. Uh, so today we are fortunate to hear from him directly. And uh, Srini, I would like to pass it on to you. Thank you very much to agree to be a speaker today. Yeah, thank you, Nikhil. Um, can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I know that uh, all of you are engineering students selected uh, to advance uh, the technology of uh, security. I hope uh, you do well. It's an important concern for our society at the moment, and uh, your success will be uh, really important to all of us. Broadly speaking, engineers are sort of down to earth. They have a view that is uh, quite pragmatic often. And I have no doubt uh, you will produce some uh, practical solutions. Engineering at its best changes the world as we know. 
However, when it is removed from ethics and integrity, it can also create havoc. Uh, we can dwell on examples and all of that, but I will not do that. I will instead talk a bit about science and the motivation for doing science. In my own life, I have not seen a huge distinction between engineering and science, although the viewpoints are obviously very different. So between uh, 2003 and 2009, for about seven years, I served as the uh, director of this thing called International Center for Theoretical Physics, ICTP as it is known to the world at large in uh, Trieste, Italy, uh, near Venice. The center is mandated to support uh, good scientists from uh, all developing countries in doing their research. It was started by uh, a very famous physicist, Nobel laureate Abdus Salam, under the aegis of uh, UNESCO, International Atomic Energy Agency, and the Italian government. Uh, while I held that position, I was concerned that science was losing um, its appeal for young students and so took the occasion of the 40th anniversary of our center to invite some hundred uh, distinguished uh, scientists with strong connections to the center, many of whom I knew, uh, to write a two-page note on uh, what really got them into science and what is interesting about science, etc. Uh, they are all wrote, and uh, about 45 of them were Nobel laureates, 25 are Fields medalists, 25 are Wolf Prize winners, and things like that. Other writers are also equally distinguished. So if I can show you the cover page of that, um, let me see. Uh, can I share my screen? Yeah, I think you can share screen. Yeah. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Let me um, show you the full screen version of it. So here. I can't see anything myself. Uh, let's go here. Okay. That's the book, 100 Reasons to be a Scientist. It was um, published by my center, but actually Norwegian Academy, with which I had many connections at that time, republished it. And uh, that's a preface I wrote, which you cannot obviously read. The book was translated into many languages, Italian, Norwegian, Chinese, Portuguese, uh, several Indian languages among them, and it's uh, freely available on uh, Google. You should read it, actually. I will uh, try to summarize uh, for you a little wisdom that came through uh, in all these essays. But let me first uh, begin by saying a few words about Abdus Salam, the founder of ICTP because some of his considerations may be important uh, for in a slightly different context. He was a great physicist and a great man with many talents, despite his uh, shortcomings. He was also a great uh, conscience keeper of the underprivileged. That's the reason I like him most. His life was a great success, but also had many uh, tragedies. After his early education in uh, Lahore, which is a, a town in um, undivided India, which is when he was born and where he was born, Salam left for St. John's College, Cambridge to study mathematics. And then he visited uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton for a while, after which he returned to the government college in Lahore as a professor and head of the Department of Mathematics. He was 25 years old. He got his PhD from Cambridge around the same time. Salam uh, had left Lahore when it was part of uh, British India, but then he came back um, as part of the new nation of Pakistan. 
Salam said uh, like this about his experience. I went back to Lahore in 1951 and taught there at the university. But as a physicist, I was completely isolated. It was very difficult to get the journals and keep in touch with my subject. This is uh, not quite true, but uh, not quite true today, but actually true in a different sense. There was no tradition of doing postgraduate work or research, no updated scientific literature, no one with whom I could talk science. There was, uh, that was what it meant. So staying in Lahore meant for him committing scientific suicide. So Salam returned in less than three years to St. John's. And then he became a fellow, then he became a professor in uh, a few years, two or three years at the Imperial College, he became an FRS at 33. And uh, he and his group did some outstanding work. And uh, he shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Sheldon Glashoff and Steven Weinberg, who uh, died uh, only 10 days ago or something like that. The fact that his love of physics was incompatible with his stay in Lahore in his own country had a deep impact on Salam. He always said that if he had the possibility of going to a center of uh, renown um, for learning every two or three months a year, he would have stayed in Pakistan and, and worked uh, there. In fact, his whole ambition then was to create a center which would invite and welcome uh, good scientists from all parts of the world so they could work for a few months. And then instead of migrating to a developed country and robbing their country of the talent, they would stay in their own country and work for it. So that was the purpose of ICTP. And when I was there as its director, I did um, uh, several things. But I will not uh, tell you, mostly I traveled uh, a lot, met with uh, many presidents and prime ministers and ambassadors and people like that, and try to get the support for basic sciences in their own countries. So uh, let me uh, start with the main theme of the, uh, my talk, which is, by the way, um, this is how uh, Salam looked. And uh, you see here, uh, the sentence, scientific thought is the heritage of all mankind, which is the idea that he promoted very strongly, even though the Western world has contributed to science in the last 300 years or so, most. Um, but before that, of course, um, science was being practiced many other places. Now, um, and this is the center that he created. Um, and uh, my office was somewhere here. Um, a very nice place. And uh, about 6,000 scientists uh, visit every year, some for short time, some for long periods of time, etc. cetera. Now, uh, in, the, in the book that I was talking about that uh, Nikhil introduced, why do young people go into science in the first place was one of the questions. Uh, Gerard uh, Tahu, the physics Nobel laureate in 1999, says that he became attentive to science as a child by observing how the laws of physics do not change. And he said, the nice thing about nature's laws is that they are fair. They're the same for everybody, and nobody has the power to change them, unlike the laws that humans have invented for themselves. Those rules could be changed by someone overnight without advance warning, but they can't do that with nature's laws. Also, these laws do not contain contradictions. They cannot. And uh, Paul Nurs, the 2001 Nobel laureate in physiology and medicine, he said, what first stimulated my interest in science was an overwhelming curiosity about how the world worked. I first remember being aware of this while walking to school, maybe at nine or 10 years of age, 
and no noticing that leaves on the same plant seemed bigger when they were growing in the shade compared with when they were growing in sunlight. That got me thinking, he said. Of course, he still asks the same type of questions, but uh, obviously more sophisticated ones and more complex ones. But uh, the basic thing is a curiosity. The key, for, uh, the, the key for keeping interest in science, aside from curiosity with which you begin, uh, there are two important points. The first is, of course, to maintain the curiosity about the world. And second is the determination to find explanations for what we see. Without the curiosity and without the determination, the passion for science and accomplishments in it is soon lost. Uh, my uh, uh, former friend is no longer alive, uh, Leo Cagna at the University of Chicago said, when I was a young man, I was first drawn to mathematics and then to physics. In contrast to the confusion and complexity of my adolescent world, the possibility of finding something indisputably real attracted my imagination. And uh, Michael Berry, Sir Michael Berry, uh, said, the excitement of scientific discovery is the inner knowledge it gives and the quiet satisfaction of something understood. David Mumford, the Fields Medalist of 1974, said this, when I was quite young, I interrupted once a painter who was an old family friend at work on his canvas, asked him for whom he is working, and he said, myself. Then it hit me. Why would anybody want to work for someone else if they could get paid for doing what they loved? If you're working for someone else, there's always a deadline, etc. It leads you in different directions. Andrew Wiles, who you must all know about, who proved Fermat's conjecture, was holed up in his attic for 10 years without publishing anything. And um, that's the kind of freedom that one can have in science, but that's mathematician speaking. It was not really um, a scientist in the sense of um, someone in, involved in a common, entrepreneur, common uh, entrepreneurship. The nature of scientific life is sometimes thought to be very lonely. Michael Berry said, that's not true. It might seem strange, but um, with, as with any human activity, in all my years of science, I've always encountered very friendly people. And this isn't because scientists are better than other people. We cooperate uh, simply because uh, nature secrets can be extracted by, by more brains than one working together. Uh, Nicholas Bloombergen, who got the 1991 Nobel Prize, said, in retrospect, my choice to become a physicist more than, a, more than 65 years ago has been very rewarding. New technologies have a profound influence in society in all countries, and they're all based on scientific principles. Every country will need future leaders with familiarity of the scientific method. So how do others feel, especially women? Uh, in particular, I don't know how many women uh, students are there in your program, but there's still not enough of them in science. In particular, many scientists bemoan the image of science as a masculine activity. Miriam Sarachek, former president of the American Physical Society and the winner of the most prestigious prize of the APS says, my life as a physicist has been enormously satisfying and great fun. That doesn't mean that every moment has been fun. There have been problems and challenges along the way, and there have been setbacks, small and large. One of the most exhilarating aspects of being a scientist is that one continues to learn, stretch, and expand. 
it's a wonderful challenge. Maxine Singer, who was the uh, scientist, distinguished scientist at Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Institute, said uh, this, doing the scientific work is demanding hard work, sometimes frustrating. In the 60 years since I entered high school, and I don't remember ever, ever being bored, however. So one cannot actually be productive throughout a uh, scientific life, I must say. One sci some scientists compensate for this diminished vigor by engaging in other activities that have uh, less demands on creativity. Uh, my former colleague at Yale, Serge Lang, was a mathematician of uh, great renown. Um, he asked his thesis advisor the following question. Okay, I got the thesis. It worked out, I had an idea, but later in life, what happens when I don't get ideas when I'm stuck? The answer he received was, that's the price you have to pay for being a mathematician. Despite this apprehension, Long became a, a, joined, became a um, professor in mathematics and did very many interesting things, but he could not handle his diminished uh, capacity for doing mathematics. And uh, I regret to say that he committed suicide. This is a weird situation, however, but the dilemma that is caused by reduced creativity is not that uncommon. So uh, we talked about uh, a few things about what gets uh, people interested in science and how uh, they function as uh, professional scientists. What about the role of parents, teachers, and society at large? Uh, Claude de Cointanuji in the 1997 Nobel laureate said, it's very important for a young child to, uh, to feel that his parents pay attention to his education. And John Fenn, a novelist in chemistry and who was my next door neighbor, said that they molded the raw material, the, the parents. The importance of parents was especially crucial for women. My parents, Helen Grant, who was the president of the APS said, my parents valued imagination and curiosity and treated me no differently from my brothers. Next to parents, the inspiration comes from teachers. My interest in physics was really stimulated by an extraordinary teacher, Sir James Cronin, 1980 Nobel Prize winner. I deeply believe in the influence that an outstanding teacher can have for arousing a scientific vocation. And the Cohen Tanuji um, said the same thing. Hans Krebs said, if I ask myself how it came about that one day I found myself in Stockholm, which is when he went to receive the Nobel Prize, I have not the slightest doubt that I owe this good fortune to the circumstance that I had an outstanding teacher. The support of teachers was uh, critical, especially for women scientists, because uh, sometimes their parents had an ambiguous outlook on the daughter's uh, preoccupation with science and mathematics. At least that was so in those years when uh, people who wrote for this were uh, young, young people. Mildred Dresselhaus, a highly uh, decorated American physicist and engineer, she basically said it was her impact, the impact of her teachers that got her into science. But beyond that, there are chance encounters. For example, the impact that, let's say, uh, people like T.D. Lee and C.N. Yang have had on many Chinese scientists is uh, just unimaginable. And uh, Daniel Tsui, a physics Nobel uh, laureate, said uh, that the impact he uh, received from them, although not knowing them at all, that those people could actually accomplish so much, had an impact on him in a very strong way. Similarly, the influence of Sir C. V. Raman, a Nobel laureate also, on young Indians uh, who wrote for this, 
Sienna Rao, Arnar Sima, and M.G. Kemenan, uh, who later distinguished themselves in many different ways, was extraordinary. So uh, occasionally, an outstanding book can have uh, an impact. Sometimes friends can have an impact as well. So Ahmed Zawail, who was uh, from Egypt and 1999 novelist in chemistry at Caltech, remarked like this, his achievements were extraordinary, but it was his family's dream that uh, saw him uh, through many uh, difficult times. And the family dream was to see him receive a high degree abroad and to become a university professor. With passion and sincerity, he says, it is possible. Everything is possible as human achievements are limited neither by race nor by origin. So in fact, uh, talking about race a little bit, uh, let me say that one should not forget that science has also been a way to escape uh, many oppressions of uh, society. Um, this experience is shared by many children of disadvantaged families in the US as well. Experience differs in different communities, obviously, and is a complex issue that I will not discuss uh, too much. But you ask any first generation student of yesteryears who went to Brooklyn Poly or to the City College, and you will see how they thought science as an uplifting agent. But for science to have an impact, um, that there is ought to be a kind of encouragement that ultimately comes from a better public understanding of the value of science and a good resonance that ought to exist between science and society. Peter Lax, uh, the Abel Prize winner and uh, my colleague at NYU said, I was born in Hungary where mathematics had a long and respected tradition. I was encouraged and tutored by distinguished mathematicians and pedagogues. If one takes a long-term perspective, nothing pays off better than the investment in improving the public appreciation of science. Jean Mark Lenn, the 1987 Nobel Prize winner, said that science education in our schools, colleges, and universities are important, but also important is the education of the general public as a major priority. In a non-democratic society, the support for science can be large or small, depending on the policies of a few. Otherwise, it's squarely the fault of the scientists if too few people in power understand science. What uh, smothers this understanding is the so-called elitist sentiment of the scientists, which many people warned against, and best expressed by the statement attributed to Luis Alvarez, a Nobel laureate in physics. There is no democracy in physics. We can't say that some second-rate guy has as much right to an opinion as Fermi. Now, that's the ethos of uh, science. Uh, but the vexing question is, the, uh, this elitism within science, how it has to translate into the society as an egalitarian concept, something that works for the good of all the society. And one has to see it uh, play out somehow. If the society perceives science as an elitist activity, you can uh, see the uneasy tension that might exist. You have seen this played out uh, or still playing out in the case of coronavirus, for instance. How do these scientists uh, view our age to be for science? Even though the scientists are optimistic about science per se, that is, it will continue to progress, they become quite pessimistic about the rising hostility within the society at large. Harold Warmus, of whom uh, you might know for many reasons, among them is 1987 Nobel Prize in Physics or Physiology or Medicine. He wondered if American science is under siege. Tullia Reggi, a very distinguished Italian physicist, said more bluntly, the image of science is tarnished, a sizable and growing fraction of the public distrust scientists 
and thinks that we are all Frankensteins. We must seek a remedy for this lamented state of affairs. A direct approach with our critics with the aim of reaching some minimal agreement is mission impossible, but you have to work at it. It's in fact a commonplace belief now that science is under attack and extraneous factors have been interfering with governmental decisions and matters of scientific research. One hears as well that the diminished role of scientists in policymaking translate to diminished concern for global change and consequences. So why is this uh, pessimism um, uh, so much? A bit of background. Uh, in the aftermath of Second World War, uh, witnessed the great surge of influence of science and scientists. Uh, their power was not subject to public scrutiny. And uh, even at that time, it was discussed a lot. With time, as the abuses of technology have increased, it has become clear that the special place that science once held in the minds and hearts of the people of industrialized countries has begun eroding. On top of it, the expense of doing science sometimes is uh, prohibitive. There's also the connection between science and the military technology that many people feel ill at ease. Uh, the, um, while the decision on the use of weaponry is often ethical and moral, et cetera, et cetera, it's clear that uh, scientists sometimes see a distinction. Now, particularly now, aside from the usual nuclear war and other types of wars and so on, which could wipe out a huge part of humanity, global problems such as the depletion of ozone, the environmental degradation, climate change, wide ranging degradation of natural resources, unknown risks associated with uh, advances in biology, public health concerns, have all caused awareness about science. It's important to discuss these issues openly with the perspective of commonly shared moral and ethical values with the society at large. There are also some concerns that scientists come across as arrogant to the public. I already talked about this a bit. There's of course no room for arrogance whatsoever because we understand so little in the first place. Indeed, the knowledge we have is not applicable to many aspects of uh, human life, such as love, hate, uh, compassion, violence, rationality, etc. Perhaps uh, what comes across as arrogance is the tendency of physical scientists to apply the objectivity of the natural world to the society around them. This perception creates imperfect relations with the public. The support is so important for science in democratic societies. While the guilt of arrogance extends to other successful professions such as medicine and law, it's particularly insidious in scientists because it's easily justified in terms of objectivity. The perception of arrogance creates a divide between scientists on the one hand and the public and alienates a large number of students. It's a barrier also to the inclusion of underrepresented groups in science. It dulls the willingness to reach out to the groups even before they achieve something, before you can spot the talent and encourage them. Several scientists point out that while our knowledge of the physical world is profound, the knowledge related to the functioning of Earth as a system, the interaction between the environment ecosystem and the behavioral patterns of living beings is poor. Those areas require a lot of integrated thinking, which can also be deep and valuable. The point is that, as I probably summarize a whole lot of things in this way. Um, the, the point is, some time ago, the population was not uh, very large. And the same uh, event, such as an earthquake or a tsunami, which might have killed 100 people, now has the potential to kill 
10,000 people if they are all focused uh, near cities, for instance. Serious new problems have arisen because of global change. Um, and um, we cannot adjust to these rapidly and the irretrievable depletion of Earth's resources and uh, dangerous epidemics, et cetera, are on the rise. So it's becoming a very different situation at the moment. There's no doubt that more science and more scientists are needed in the world. Essentially, everyone agrees that science and technology will continue to advance rapidly. What is important is to ensure that these advances benefit humanity as a whole. Parochial considerations, commercial interests, false nationalism, fundamentalist religious aspects, inflexible ideology, they all divide us and uh, human dignity and human rights get forgotten. Harmony with nature gets forgotten, all of that. As Susan Solomon, an accomplished atmospheric scientist said, science is a very important role to play in serving society, helping us to understand what is happening and why. Science is an important input to many societal choices, but it is only one input. An important issue concerns the attitude of the scientist with respect to ethics and society. Leo Kadnoff said, scientists are better at finding true things than knowing the nature of love, justice, humanity, or indeed truth. As I have become more modest in my hopes for what portion of the world can be encompassed by science, I remain steadfastly tied to the original idea that science has the possibility to discover and state things which have a considerable content of verifiable correctness. In doing that, science might perhaps serve as an example to other parts of life. Our world suffers from abundance of falsehoods, false narratives, as in classifying a whole group of people as evil, or in enlisting um, some old idea that does not uh, work as being uh, very important, or in treating parochial political views as universal, or is in describing management theft as protecting the interests of stockholders, all of that. One major benefit that might be provided by science and scientists is to serve as an example of an area in which such falsehoods are neither prevalent nor rewarded. Unfortunately, that's not so either. Our own scandals, that is scandals in science, are comparable to those in other walks of life. When we get wildly optimistic about uh, cold fusion or about heart fusion for that matter, or find a new uh, need for developing technology for shooting down asteroids, argue about practical benefits from huge investments in impractical science, we are behaving in much the same self-serving fashion. We cannot claim that our world is managed any better than let's say corporate accounting. And if we scientists don't represent the truth, who will? So the problem is, <coughs> as I said, the problem that the scientists, that the beliefs that the scientists have uh, about the universal values of science. As a result, honest physicists sometimes are perhaps victims of those who do not feel restricted by normal ethics in society. Open discussion about these important challenges is really uh, very critical. In particular, environmental ethics demands different considerations. Equity within this generation is perhaps no more important than intergenerational equity, issues of bioethics, and so forth. What's the meaning of consent in the case of genetic testing and screening of an illiterate woman whose blood will be used to look for rare genes? To whom does the knowledge belong? What will they be used for? Will they eventually serve the purpose of some multinational company? So uh, here I come at last to the advice that these scientists have for young, young students. 
The advice varies in range. Basically, they echo Max's single statement that each scientist discovers a passion for science in a unique way. Marcos uh, Moshinsky of Mexico says as follows, my advice to young physicists and also to young scientists in any field is not the example of Einstein to work in a lighthouse far from the pressures and distraction of the main institutions of learning, but rather choose a university or research group that is just beginning to be able to contribute to the transformation of an idea into first rate um, uh, concept, first rate uh, accomplishment. This echoes the sentiment by Jim Watson, whom you know very well. I think it is extraordinarily important that you have a scientific patron because there will be times when you are bound to strike it bad and you will need somebody to convince people that you are not an irresponsible person. I should also quote uh, Christian Du, 1974 novelist in physiology and medicine. Scientists are often described as persons who know a lot. That's not entirely wrong in their own field. To do good science, you must be trained and you must know a lot. In addition, you must know what others have been doing in your field, but that's not enough. A know-it-all attitude is no more uh, useful in a scientist than in, uh, than in an ordinary person. What counts is the generation of new knowledge or better said, understanding. The true aim of science is to understand the world. Not everybody can be a Newton, Darwin, or Einstein. Most of us do not grapple with cosmic issues and have to be content with adding a little brick to the edifice. On a day-to-day -day basis, scientific research deals mostly with small problems. There's space with some intriguing fact or observation that tickles your curiosity. Thinking about it, they let your imagination run, using all the available clues, all the bits of relevant knowledge you happen to have in store, trying to come up with some plausible explanation. This is the truly creative part of scientific activity, what it has in common with fine arts. But it is only the first step because the scientist has to confront his theory or creativity with facts. Does it with with all, does it fit with all observations? How can you best fit its, uh, test its validity? Not by trying to prove it right, but by doing the best to prove it wrong and failing. There's much more in this book that I just mentioned um, from which I have given you some extracts. I hope you will get the gist of it and in fact, enjoy reading it. So in your own life, be curious and be determined and find some supportive friends and environment. Stay focused, enjoy doing um, uh, intellectual work. You will eventually get there. When I say you will eventually get there, I don't mean that all of you will become an Albert Einstein or even Thomas Edison. Um, that is not for all of us somehow. Uh, it's a bigger topic which, 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 uh, which we can uh, have a long conversation sometime later. But achieving your sense of inner fulfillment is what it will help you. And I think that is the best that, can, that one can hope for in uh, one's life. So enjoy your program and do well. And thank you very much for letting me say a few words. Thank you very much, Srini. It's, it's a wonderful presentation. And your presentations always give more homework for background reading for a lot of things that you have said. Uh, just one question in the interest of time I wanted to ask. And uh, I, I advise a nonprofit organization of uh, postdocs. And the reality today is that there are more people who want to be scientists and professors than the openings out there. Yes. And some of them are in long-term postdocs or you know PhD students yes. and graduate not able to find positions. Yes. So what advice do you see and how do you see this evolving? The important thing is in the past, I think a lot of professors thought that their job was to create images of their own. That is students who would become professors elsewhere and carry their message. 
Um, but I think that's a very limited view. And uh, education in uh, areas like physics and engineering and mathematics can be useful in, in enormous number of other ways. I think if we don't limit ourselves to the ambition of being a professor like my own, um, many things become uh, a bit uh, easier. Of course, the kind of jobs one has available depends upon how fast the society is expanding. And uh, you know, as long as the society ultimately thinks that science and scientific endeavors are important, there will be opportunities. So the uh, very, very important part eventually comes back to what I said a few times, that is somehow involving the society at large in a discussion that science is important, uh, technology is not all evil, and uh, how and that their support is really very important. So somehow we don't close the circle very well. And I think because of that, there is disconnect often from one thing to another. And, um, and the problem that you mentioned is very real. And I would say that the postdocs must expand their horizons. And uh, many people have gone off into non-academic work and have found a real fulfillment in doing this and have always found their technical education to be of extraordinary value. That's my short answer. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So we'll move on to the results stage. We have the results, uh, I think. John okay, guys, I'll first. sign off and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Okay, bye. John? Would you like to take over? I'll start off with uh, thank you, Professor okay. Cooper. Um, and uh, thank you for all the Hack3D teams. I think uh, for each team presentation, we really enjoy uh, learning the, your thought process, the, your creativity that involved in solving each uh, uh, clues included into our uh, challenge and how you utilize that clue to help you formulate certain conclusions that lead you to the five digit pin. Uh, we also wanted to uh, um, understand more about uh, in the challenge with all of the objectives, the main uh, point was the fingerprints. So seeing how each of the teams were able to utilize the clues within the fingerprint uh, to uh, add to their conclusion of uh, which was the pin order that was entered as well as the order of uh, uh, entry uh, input by the user. Uh, from the fingerprint, uh, there was uh, presentations um, uh, looking at whether it's a right hand or left hand uh, input user, uh, looking into the thickness, uh, which was well thought out, as well as the uh, different angles of the fingerprint that was used. So there was a lot of creativity there, and we really enjoyed seeing that. As well as the reconstruction of the QR code, we saw a few different methods used to reconstruct the QR code to generate what was the uh, embedded link. Uh, so after the judge's deliberation, um, we've uh, talked through all of these creative ideas by the student team, and we really enjoy seeing uh, each team's presentation and their thought process. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, take a moment to pass it over to John uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the judging process. And yeah. Thanks, Gary. So, of course, uh, as a judge, or, you know, we were all very impressed and are, uh, you know, uh, know that we're going to have a good future because everybody is bright and smart and everything. You guys all did a great job. Uh, um, you know, everybody figured out a huge amount of information in a short amount of time, right? You guys only had like 24 hours to figure all these things out, and there was an immense amount of clues, and you all did a great job uh, trying to iterate through the different solutions that you could find. Um, presentations, you guys did a great job of explaining what you did, um, beautiful slides and things like that. Um, <laughs> speaking for uh, a little bit for Chris and Stacy as well, uh, we all learned something from your presentations. Uh, I learned about the different sizes of QR codes and uh, the amount of air percentage they can have. Uh, I think a few of us also under learned about uh, Little Alchemy. Uh, you know, uh, I, I never played that when I was in fifth grade. Um, so. 
Uh, very impressive, just the different ways the different teams handled the challenges, um, whether it was, you know, pulling apart the metadata and looking into those files or, you know, converting things into step files in order to use the software that was available. Um, it, it was just very impressive, everybody's work and, and congratulations, to everybody. It made it very hard to figure out who, um, who would be the, the winners for today. Um, so uh, congratulations to everybody. And I'll turn it back to Gary for the announcements of the, of the winners. Thank you, Judge. Uh, thank you, John, uh, for uh, speaking on behalf of the judges. And for the Hack 3D Summer Challenge, uh, it, there was a lot of close calls, but I would like to uh, move forward to announcing our third place winner. So third place for Hack 3D Summer Challenge goes to family.py. So congratulations to Abdul, Dev, Hassan, and Solomon. And now moving on to the second place uh, Hack 3D Summer Challenge winner. For second place, we have Team 3D AD. So congratulations to Yusuf, Cornelius, and Hong. And now for our first place winner, I'd like to congratulate team, the PC squad. So congratulations to Varun, Asupal, Hirsch, and Nia. Little round of applause there. So congratulations to all the teams. Yeah. Uh, I know a, a lot of the teams within the 24 hour period put out a lot of effort. So uh, there was a lot of uh, different things that we were uh, scoring based on and uh, a lot of teams, all of the teams did a great job. So uh, thank you all uh, for participating and congratulations to uh, the PC squad, uh, uh, team 3D AD and family.py. Uh, for a conclusion statement, uh, I want to uh, signify that that's not the end of Hack 3D. So that was only Hack 3D Summer Challenge. Uh, in the fall, we'll also be hosting another round of Hack 3D competitions. And uh, the top three teams, first and second and third place, will uh, get direct entry to the final round in the fall competition. But all of the teams that have uh, participated will get a, a, another chance at participating in the Hack 3D Fall Challenge. So definitely uh, take note of when the qualification start dates and uh, Registrations will open uh, shortly within uh, a month. So with that, I'd like to conclude uh, today's presentation on the Hack 3D final event. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for participating. Thank you to all the organizers. Thank you to all of the judges, as well as thank you to NSF National Science Foundation for uh, supporting uh, our competition. So thank you all. Hope you have a great day. Take care and once again, congratulations to all the top three teams.